Yeah, man. From like hearing all these stories, <laughs> none of them sound positive. <laughs> well, okay. Well, but then there's properties like mine. Yeah. Like uh, my dad had purchased the property pre construction, took seven years to build. He passed away in that time. I bought it off my mom. She didn't want it. She paid three fifty four. I can sell for six hundred thousand. I've been renting it for two thousand dollars a month. If more than covers my cost, I can put five hundred dollars in my pocket every single month. Mm-hmm. I bought one in Leslieville for the free twenty. It's not built yet. It, it's worth six hundred fifty seven hundred thousand dollars. I bought another one on in the Tobicals. We paid just under eight hundred dollars. So it's like almost a thousand nine hundred square feet with two part one parking. I could turn around flip that for a million dollars now. Mm-hmm. We bought another one in. Uh, we just we just closed one in uh, in Kitchener. Paid three hundred thousand dollars for it. I could sell for six hundred. It just got built and registered. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are four wins right there. But I can I can push back on this, right? I can say. All right, everybody, welcome back to the DC Talks podcast. I'm your co-host, Ono Sende, with the main man, David Chinelli. We're back in the building today for something interesting, a case study. Interesting. Interesting, right? Episode four, and uh, we decided to do something different, switch it up. That's why we have the scotch. A scotch. You know, what, what are you drinking today, Dave? Uh, so it's a 14-year Glen Marangi. Mm. Yeah, it's, nice. it's got a nice little flavor to it. It's smooth. You know, yeah. we're here chopping it up. And um, the story that we're talking about today, Dave, is something that came about in Toronto Life back in January 2017. The story is the real estate mogul who left 200 home buyers in the lurch. Have you heard about this story before? Uh, briefly, yeah. Briefly, eh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with the story, I'm going to give you a story synopsis. I'm going to give you the details of what happened in this story. And then after that, we're going to turn it back to you. And then when uh, Great. you know, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> He's not the person who made people like lose their, yeah. their deposits. But mm-hmm. you know, we're gonna give you like your take, have your insights into this story, sure. um, because us on the outside, we need to be aware of these different things that happen for other people, so we avoid that. So the story starts with a company called Urban Corp. So Urban Corp is a property developer with a 24-year track record of building moderately priced condos and townhomes in the GTA. The story talks about two uh, individuals. They're a couple, Patrick and Jesse Hooker. They wrote down four posted checks for $58,000 to purchase a 580,000 townhome that did not exist yet. They moved out of their condo into a two bedroom apartment in Jesse's sister's basement in Richmond Hill, hoping to save money for their down payment. They commuted an hour each day for their jobs. Uh, Jesse, in January, Jesse was pregnant um, and they were glad that they had the foresight to lock down a home as she was becoming pregnant. One last day of April, a year and a half before they were supposed to move in, Patrick was reading a discussion thread on Buzz Buzz Home, a website that tracks new housing developments. There was a rumor circulating that Urban Corp was in financial trouble, that the company might be on the verge of filing for bankruptcy, bankruptcy protection, which would jeopardize all of its unbuilt projects. When a buyer places a deposit on an unbuilt condo, this is what everybody should know, a developer is required under Ontario's Condominium Act to either ensure the deposit or hold in it in a trust account so the money can be refunded if the project is canceled or delayed. So Hooker's house was freehold, which means the Condominium Act didn't apply to them. So freehold properties, developers can do whatever they want with the deposits. So this is where something interesting comes in. Which I didn't even know <clears throat> that. You know, the freeholds are able to do anything they want with that. I didn't. You didn't know that, right? I didn't know that. Yeah, I just like because we always most of the pre-construction we've I've dealt with has all been condos, and I've sold a number of them, and it's mm-hmm. always been, you know, it's we've it's always done a trust to the lawyer's account, and uh, so I remember like reading that and saying like, huh. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Like they can do what they want with. What do you mean they can do what they want with it? Like, right? What? Like I'm, that? I'm giving you my money and you can do whatever you want. Yeah, with that it. that's makes, insane. Yeah. And how would like? So we, the thing is, when you buy a pre-construction condo, like property, you have a 10-day cooldown period. Mm. I'm surprised that your lawyer is supposed to review the document in that time. Yeah. I'm surprised there's been no lawyer saying like, whoa, 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 like where's this money going? Mm-hmm. Like, 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 what do you mean it's not going to trust account? Like, I can't. Yeah. To me, that just it, the way that things are running nowadays. I don't know if this would ever fly. I don't. I thought maybe because this had changed. It's maybe also, maybe it was 2017. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe things have changed. I, I'm assuming so, but mm-hmm. yeah, like, because even my clients bought uh, a freehold uh, townhouse and they just closed on it, and theirs was in trust. Mm-hmm. So that's why. 
I've never heard of them not having a trust. The lawyer handled this. So that's why it was like a red flag to me. I'm like, what do you mean it wasn't held by the lawyer? Anyway. And also, like, they, they just walk into like a, the space, they write four post dated checks with five. That's people. normal. That's normal, right? That's normal. And like, and this is where we're going to cook later on. But, um, <laughs> you know, let's actually talk about the, the company founder and president. So his name is Alan Sakin. You familiar with him? No. So he was the Urban Corps president and founder him and his wife you know they live a lavish lifestyle in yorkville six million dollar condo with three bedrooms a library a master suite uh, with spacious dressing room a private terrace drives a tesla and aston martin so this story like the the author of who, the person who's writing the story really goes deep into who this person is to really yeah, set but the if, stage. They're, if, if they've built multiple properties beforehand mm-hmm. they should have the money to do that like that's it's not like, you can't say they took all the money to pay for their current property like mm-hmm. that's you know that's jumping to conclusions so like mm-hmm. i understand these they're painting a picture that's what you know yeah. news news story they want to show him living a lavish lifestyle of so course he screws people over they're like ah look this this guy was spending oh he could afford, like, he what's he afford doing? all yeah. these different things right so urban corp started developing low-rise and mid-rise projects through the gta by 1998, the company had become the fifth largest builder of new homes in the GTA, and it had a major major land purchase that would change the city, an ex-industrial site on King West or ba- of Bathurst. So the issue is selling units before they've been approved by the city, strained relationships with customers. So this is the reputation that Urban Corp started to develop. So things get interesting here. So this is where the it's time- interesting was- already? Oh man, it gets, <laughs> it, gets, it gets even juicier, right? <coughs> One company, Terraform Capital Corporation, financed large swaths of Urban Corp's land purchase starting in 2012. The loans allowed Urban Corp to acquire more and more land, but in the process, the company took on a huge debt load, while bank lenders usually only financed between 50 and 75% of the land purchase value. Urban Corp was often using a combination of Terraform's loans and bank loans to finance up to 95% of the land purchase price. From 2012, they had made purchase on projects near Queen and Dufferin, 14 to 16 story building. In the East End, the company encountered similar problems. At 50 Curzon Street in Leslieville, Urban Corp had pre sold 55 townhouses. And according to a former site superintendent who worked on the development, the project started to unravel mid construction. So the crew stopped showing up for work. And the reason was simple, Urban Corp wasn't paying them. In September, their bosses began began flooding the property with construction liens. One quote was saying, we must have spent six months here doing nothing, said the superintendent. Then in fall 2014, pre-construction purchases at Urban Corp townhouses development in Etobicoke discovered their houses had been downsized because the original plans hadn't received approval from city council. Many buyers tried to back out of their sales agreements after two years of delays, only to learn that Urban Corp wouldn't refund their money for months. So when developers fall short of their obligation, there's one organization that's supposed to keep them honest, and this is Terion, the private, not-for-profit corporation that enforces yeah. Ontario's New Home, New Home Warranties Plan Act. Not a huge fan of them. Anyway, You're not a huge fan of them? I, it's... They, I've heard so many negative things about Tarion. It's supposed to protect, but it's, they're shady yeah. guys too, eh? Listen, I, I, I didn't say that. Uh, I'm also not saying that. <laughs> you, know, I, you didn't say nothing. I didn't say that. I just, All right. I just I don't know enough about them. I just I haven't heard I, I haven't heard a lot of good things. Mm. You know, and, and so Tarion, what it is supposed to do is like if you're buying a brand new home, it's supposed to protect the home buyers, and and there's certain years for, for certain protections you get. Mm-hmm. Right, if you're buying a house. Uh, the first year is supposed to include like you know appliances and things like you know like uh, foundations, actually foundations up to two years I believe in case there's a water leak or something supposed to protect you, and then up to seven years it's some of the other fundamentals of the home. So mm-hmm. depending on there too, but to make a claim against them has been the best. And now moving forward in, in, uh, as of 2022, in order for you to, to purchase a brand new home, you have to have a Terran warranty. You can't just go out and build a property and, and sell it mm-hmm. if you're like you're a builder. Like and you have to. So they kind of have a monopoly on it too. So mm-hmm. anytime you have a monopoly on a property, it just kind of like, I kind of like, like you need to have a tear on warranty on this mm-hmm. too. And it's like, it's, I don't know. It's, if a builder's warranty wouldn't suffice, the reason why we found this out is like I, I, we sold the property mm-hmm. in 2021 and that the, the builder, the builder like, who worked for tear didn't want to do it. He goes, I'll just give you my own warranty. And we were okay with that. And all of a sudden, Scotia came back and said, you need a tear-on warranty. We're like, what? They passed the law. And they're saying, as of January 2021, mm-hmm. you need tear-on warranty for a new build if you haven't lived in the property. Why Why do we need that guarantee as opposed to like a builder guarantee? It mm-hmm. just seemed 
off. You know seemed what I mean? Off, eh? It just seems off to me. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't like to interject there. It was just. No, no. That's good When I heard commentary. the word Tarion, it's like, you know, and the thing is, it kind of gives you like some buyers that warm, fuzzy feeling that we mm-hmm. have turn on warranty. But sometimes you get money out of them. It's not the easiest. Mm. So. Yeah. So. And that's what they did here. So, and then by 2015, Urban Corp had invested in at least 17 pieces of land in five years. Only two developments had been completed, and the company was hermaging money and as it tried to keep up with its debts. Among its holdings were nearly $16 million worth of deposits from home buyers at five unbuilt townhouses, townhouse developments. So, Alan Sacken, the president, goes to the Israelis to get more money oh, to finance these debts. So he goes over there, he does something called a road show. This is like essentially where you travel around, like just present presenting to them. Yep. Um, you know, well, we used to do that with Toronto Hydro too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the funny thing is when he was doing this, none of them actually Googled Urban Corp. They were just, he was just going and getting money from the Israelis, but they didn't even do their due diligence. So oh, they're writing shit. checks and everything. And uh, when he comes back to Canada, you know, things kind of hit the, hit the fan right (laughs) when you know he can't pay back um his debts the properties aren't getting built uh people are starting to question like where's my home like and people like getting so annoyed because they tell them you're moving in let's say august 2015 and then it's okay you move in into january um august 2016 okay September. So people, their dates are getting pushed back and back. And this is how this story became such a big thing. So now, um, essentially, Saskin had to file for bankruptcy because he couldn't complete the projects. The Israelis came back and said, you know what? You owe us money. So he was in a lot of debt. But the one positive thing he had was he had projects which had been built already. So he could actually sell those properties to other people just to pay back the debt so you know this is where we come to you now right um this is a mess of a story a lot of people (coughs) look to buy pre-construction because you know you can just put some money down and you can you know pay for it later um when you had a chance to review this story david uh what was your biggest takeaway there's a lot of them uh well we talked earlier about like not having Sorry, putting the deposits not within mm-hmm. a trust account, which is so they can access that was a big red flag. Mm-hmm. Uh, next was uh, selling properties before they were okayed by the city. This yeah. has been a problem for a number of developers we've been seeing more recently. I had a client of mine too. We had bought a per property in Waterloo, which mm-hmm. they assumed that they were going to get it too. And, like, and the project was canceled. And then my client, after two years, got his money refunded. Uh, but he also opportunity cost was there too. Like he didn't, he got his money back, mm-hmm. but no interest on it, right? So mm-hmm. it was like it was things was like, yeah, let's cost two pieces. But they didn't tell us they didn't get mm-hmm. approved by the city. Most of the projects we've ever purchased before are going through our brokerage, usually they're approved. So I, I, I've I've heard of that lately too. The other thing is that you know, Buzz Buzz Homes. I like Buzz Buzz Homes. Uh, it's a it's a good website. Uh, but the funny thing is the thread on that too. It's like when you're trying to do research, we're trying to like Buzz Buzz has a good research on that too like you look at these properties mm-hmm. you know it had a good track record so you're trying to do your due diligence and you're like and you can still get screwed to this company it's not like a it's like some of these companies right in the past where i've noticed where some of these pre-constructions have had problems uh fulfilling their obligations is when you know they try to go from like their medium building to try to do like a high rise and they just didn't you know, didn't have the wherewithal of doing it. They didn't know mm-hmm. the amount of structure. The, like they didn't structure the properties right. They would have gone bankrupt. They would have done that. Like they were yeah. going to get the approval. These guys seems like they've been doing it before, and it still didn't do it right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's another red flag. It was just like what? And you know, the thing it's scary, right? Because Urban Corp had existed for such a long time, right? So they have the branding, and they have the pedigree of becoming like trusted builders. But you have a corrupt founder and president who, you know, he's expediting a lot of his deals super fast by taking a lot more leverage that can, he can actually afford and ends up screwing up the buyers instead. So what I want to ask you is, if you're looking to buy a pre-con, how do you do due diligence into the buyer, into yeah. the into the builder? So, uh, good, great question. Uh, I got asked this question all the time for, for pre-construction. How do we qualify? So the first thing we do is, uh, you know, I have a, we have a pre-construction manager in my office. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's one of the owners and uh, he, like, he helps vet some of the builders. So, I go through them, you know, like I ask them too and say, hey, you have a you have a relationship with these guys. What do you know about these? And they do some digging. We you check out Buzz Buzz Homes. You check out, you try, you look at Terrion, try to see if mm-hmm. there's any claims against the property or, or against the owners because mm-hmm. Terrion will have 
a number of those claims. If you if so, builders don't like to do don't like any claims against them because it's public knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. So you look at them, try to see what their developments have been, like, and if it's a smaller company that doesn't have a good track record. You know, it's it's kind of hard. To, I don't convince my clients, and I'm like, here, here's what I found. Like, they mm-hmm. haven't really done this. Like, you're kind of taking a risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, trying to turn my guys from not doing that. Like, then you have other builders, like a Tridel, for example, which they're like the gold standard, right? When it comes to like building, so I'm like, you know, when they're going to be building. When they say they can build a project, they've done everything. They've been doing it for over 100 years. Like, yeah. it's ridiculous. When they when they come to the market, you're like, yeah, sure. They ask you for more things because like. You have to you have the total line with them, but you, at least you have the guarantee that a that it's going to be built, and b is like when they tell you the days will be built, like the longest delay I've ever seen is like six months. Mm. So it's always good to be a little builder that way, and then it, sure you can take a chance on that too. But yeah, like having people that have worked with these type of builders and calling around and finding that is 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 huge. Yeah, yeah. So you have, I, it's you have to try to do due diligence. Try to, we've had other pre-construction managers that would have left, and I call them. I'm mm-hmm. still having a relationship with them. Talk to them. Say, hey, what do you know about this company? <clears throat> yeah, and you know, but the day, even even good companies can fail. Exactly, and this is where things get tricky because now you have all these couples who are expecting children, and they're making down these deposits because they're thinking, you know, what? Well, by the time the baby's born, we're gonna have like an extra bedroom. There's gonna be a playroom. There's gonna be more space. Now they're down fifty eight thousand dollars. Can you sue the oh, the builder? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, well, if, in that case, if they don't return the money, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, there's that other case, I remember years ago, where they were fraudulently holding like that. It was in Scarborough. Mm. And uh, there was a bunch of builders, and they, they tried to get the money from the builder. They couldn't, ever, they couldn't find them. So mm-hmm. who are you going to sue if you can't find them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if they're not paying you back, yeah, you have a, but if they go bankrupt, what do you, you, know, they, you can't bleed a stone. Mm-hmm. So you can sue them, but you're not going to get anything back. Mm-hmm. That's why it's supposed to be held in trust. If it's yeah. held in trust, you get that money back because they're not allowed to touch the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the idea, right? So I don't know. One of the red flags I would say to you is like, well, where's this? Your lawyer should be talking to this now with, with these happening. We're like, talk to your lawyer that's reviewing this because you have a 10 day cooling down period. Mm-hmm. In the 10 day cooling down period, which if you sign a pre construction deal, your lawyer reviews this and they come back and say, okay, here's kind of the red flags I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. Here's kind of the potentials which like you, you could. It could pitfalls you have. One of the things that the reason why you hire a realtor to do like a pre-construction was like we try to cap our levies. You know, levies are expenses you're spending, which they anticipate the builder mm-hmm. and which they get add on. If you don't cap them, if you have which means a max amount that the, the builder can back to you, those can be exorbitant. Like mm-hmm. I've heard of like some levies being sixty five, a hundred thousand dollars on top of your so if you paid, you know, six hundred thousand dollars for a property and you didn't cap your levies, and all of a sudden the builder adds on another hundred thousand dollars, I'm like that's a seven hundred thousand dollar property. Mm-hmm. You only paid. You only signed on for six, but you didn't cap. So anyway, like, I would talk to your lawyer. Like, where's the money being held? Isn't if it doesn't say trust account because you write out the check, and it should say, and trust. If it's mm-hmm. not in trust, like, okay, where's this money going? How can they? If they say they can tap in your money, like, I would, I wouldn't touch that property. Yeah, I wouldn't touch it. Because mm-hmm. in the story, like back in the end, this is what we we're talking about earlier, right? Um, they can do whatever they want with their money, which was like super alarming that for me. That blows my mind. What that, do you mean you can, you can do whatever, do whatever you want? want? Like you pay, I give you 58K of my money and I'm just supposed to, be, okay, whatever. It's like I'm taking a risk into the market. Like yeah. I'm investing in a stock or something that doesn't even exist. Here. There's no value. It's like investing in Bitcoin. It's like, hey, you might get something, but hey, you know what? It Don't might start crash. Me on Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get burned or something? No, no, no. I just... No, I'm just saying with cryptocurrencies and stuff too, I just don't want to invest in things that I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just don't get if somebody wants to pull a plug on that and you don't lose all your money. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Just don't get me started. I'm like, because I just, to me, you know, they tell you, like, these guys just talking about the blockchain and they're mm-hmm. talking about that. I don't know. I like investing in real like properties I could even see. Like, so even if it's the stock market, I'm like, at least I can see the company. You can <laughs> like, see the, the fundamentals. The fundamentals behind it, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like I can look at the financials. Like if you're in Bitcoin and you're like, you're just hoping nobody else pulls them to the, pulls like like it just to me, it it, it oh, just it fundamentally to me doesn't make sense. And you seen what happened with FTX recently too. Yeah. See, that's another big story right there. But anyway, it's just, again, I, it, guys, I'm, I'm telling you, and I've said this over and over again, invest in things that you understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And I'm back- not saying you can see and physically touch. I'm saying things you understand. Mm-hmm. I Think- don't understand it. I'm not going to touch it. Yeah. NFTs. Like, I'm not paying 
forty thousand dollars for a picture of this big which is a digital picture to me it just doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. i'm sorry yeah <laughs> so you're like an old school mindset like hey invest in what you know and like things that make sense yeah 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 because yeah. i think at the end of the day nobody can wipe out my, my computer like if you have art for mm-hmm. example like art's a thing of watches jewelry we talked about this earlier yeah. too. it's like you physically have that stuff it's always good to have some backup things like mm-hmm. that too like so if the digital age ends of the world armageddon comes and all of a sudden everything i mean you need to get buy somehow like without a, if you have a digital currency there's no digital like let's say the rest of the world is running fine mm-hmm. we just don't have any digital I'm like well i had a whole bunch of digital currency I'm like oh, that's not gonna be useful anymore mm-hmm. i don't know that's just how i guess you know, so like some things are yeah i am old school like i like doing i love technology i do but some things i'm just kind of like yeah yeah but well, you know to stay in your lane yeah. yeah 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 that's the best way to put it yeah yeah <laughs> um going back to pre-con right here right uh what are the pros and cons of getting into a pre-construction build there was a lot more pr- uh, pros when i started buying a pre-construction so the pre-construction game has changed a lot recently. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when I first started investing in pre-construction, there was some advantages. Um, the first mm-hmm. thing was was that you were purchasing something off of plans mm-hmm. and it was less than a resale property than it currently was. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at a condo in uh, like say Leslieville, like one of the ones we purchased, condos at that point were selling $400,000. Mm-hmm. I bought one for 325, 320. So it's 80,000 below market value. So I'm like, yeah. It's great. It's going to take seven years to build. It'll it'll grow with the market. You're taking a chance of because we were taking a chance mm-hmm. on a builder. At the end of the day, the project can get canceled. Yeah. So you're taking a risk. So it was that it was below market value. Second was the pay structure. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to pay twenty percent within three, four, sometimes the first fifteen percent within the first two, three years, and the last five percent when it's built. Mm-hmm. So you basically have five, seven years to pay twenty percent. It's great. So there's the market value. There was the pay structure. Oh, the third one was uh, mortgage. Mm. you didn't really need a mortgage all i need to do is get a what they call the pre-approval i go mm. into a bank and i say hey this project is going to be worth you know gonna be built in five years can you write me a letter saying i'm qualified i will be qualified in five years <laughs> so it really wasn't worth the paper was written on because who knows what's going to happen in the five years yeah but those are the three criteria that's all you need and you can go in and then it was fine mm-hmm. In today's environment, prices have skyrocketed. Now builders are trying to build in like what they think the value is going to be in four years. Mm. So you're paying more for a pre-construction than you are for a resale. And you don't know what it looks like. You don't know how it feels. They can change things on you. There's, yeah. They can change things. Like, for example, one of my pre-construction, they're like, you know what? We, we're putting a pillar here. I'm like, what do you mean a pillar? I'm like, well, it's in the 3%. that's in your document that we're able to add this. And what we figured we needed to add this. And I'm like, so I just lost percentage of my of my square footage you're like mm-hmm. yeah but it's in the allotted amount you're allowed to lose i couldn't say anything i yeah. wanted the property uh so yeah so you don't know what it feels like mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to be built as an investor i don't give a shit mm-hmm. hell take 10 years <laughs> i don't care i'm not living in it so yeah. i've already paid my structure it's not gonna matter but if you're looking to move into it you're a first-time home buyer those extra couple of years changes yeah uh, my wife has a friend uh, who's a realtor as well she bought a pre-construction when she was single. By the time the property was built, she had dated her husband for a number of years, got married, had three kids, and the property was then built. Her life totally changed <laughs> 180 by the time this one little condo, one bedroom condo was yeah, built. Yeah. And she was supposed to move into that. Yeah. So again, so the timing, you know, mm-hmm. that, that's not an advantage. Uh, and now a lot of these projects are asking for now a firm approval. So you have to go to the bank and ask for firm approval, which means, you know, so it's like you're they're, they're saying what you're, what you're approved for today, mm-hmm. try to lock you in a rate. You have no idea what's going to happen in four years. Mm-hmm. You know, so those, those are like some disadvantages, I would mm-hmm. say. And the other thing is like some of these, like Tridel, out. Tridel will ask you to pay the first 20% within the first 365 days. So you no longer can stretch out that 20%. Yeah. So a lot of these, like some of these projects are just don't make fundamental sense mm-hmm. for, for investors. It just... It just doesn't. So. Mm. But then there are also other ones which we purchased, which are, so we purchased recently too. But we had, we, we were with RBC. We partnered with RBC. RBC gave us a firm approval. So it's not going to be ready another two, three years, but I don't have to go back to the bank. It's mm-hmm. great. We had bought it close to market value at the time. The property's gone up in value. So there are, don't get me wrong, it's not all projects are the same. Just it was the norm mm-hmm. when I first started pre construction that everything was below market value. Those are all the advantages. Mm-hmm. Those are three advantages. Now you got to find some of the advantages. Yeah. They're no longer. They're no longer set in stone. Mm. 
And like, what's the average gain in equity do you see on a pre-con? Oh, dude, there's no average gain in equity, man. It's the market has changed so fast mm -hmm. that, uh, and the, now the builders are building in. Like, there's no average. I would mm -hmm. say, like, it's it's hard to say or not. I honestly, I saw a project in Leslie, not Leslie, oh, sorry, in Yorkville, asking for three thousand dollars a square foot. That means a thousand square foot condo in Leslieville is going to be three million dollars. What's your return on equity on that? Negative. Negative, bro. Negative. Yeah. There's other ones I saw in Brampton. No offense to Brampton, but Brampton's not a Toronto. Going for fourteen hundred dollars mm -hmm. square foot. There's current resales of mm -hmm. Toronto projects that are not fourteen hundred dollars a square foot. So I, I don't know. It, and the market has it changed. Just, so it just much. changes so it just much. Changes it's so fluctuating fast. so much. And then now, since with the interest rate increases. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people can't afford to pay all the what the pre-cons they have purchased. So now that's yeah. why you're seeing all these assignment sales. And assignment sales when you are selling a pre-construction paper, so something that's not built yet, and selling mm -hmm. to another buyer um, because they can't qualify now mm -hmm. to because the rates have changed so much that they're going to be in negative equity position mm -hmm. that they're just trying to unload them. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the that the assignment market right now is insane i wouldn't mm -hmm. touch it with the 10 foot pole yeah so, yeah so yeah, and i was always been curious too like the deposit structure right because you can hey pre-con sounds good how does that look like for a pre-con you mentioned 20 percent down can you prolong that 20 percent no. can you break it down into certain payments for certain on, builders it depends on your builder basically the, the builder tells you the structure mm -hmm. so during covid times the structure had changed so a lot of times it'll be like so the regular norm is 5% pretty much within 30 days. So you do like a 5% deposit to secure the, the property. Mm -hmm. And then within that 10 day to cooling down period, after it's done within 30 days, you have to give the first 5%. Mm -hmm. So the next 5% is usually within 120 days, sometimes 270. The third one is due like maybe 270, 365 days. So it's 15%. And then the last 5% is due within the, when, the, when the property closes. Mm -hmm. But then like I said, you have properties like you have the clients like, sorry, builders like Tridel who do all of 20% within mm. 365 days. Then when COVID hit, some of them were saying, oh, you have to give us 10%. And then you don't have to do another 10% until closing. So it depends on the builder. Depends on the builder, right? Eh? Yeah. And I was like, I'm curious to, to know about how the mortgage side of things work because I can put down the payment for the pre-con. Um, when does the mortgage kick in for the build, for the property? So there's a difference. Uh, there's a difference between when a pre-construction building is built between occupancy mm -hmm. and registration, okay? Occupancy is when you are allowed to move into a condo or a house or pre-construction build that was previously built, um, but you don't actually own the property yet, so the mortgage isn't due yet. Mm -hmm. So think about it, so the builder owns the land. What they do is they build around, so they, they figure out the whole structure. So say it's a condo, let's just make it easy. What they'll do is they'll, they'll build the basement, the foundation, and then they'll build up, they'll do the shell. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is level by level, they will start f fixing the suites. Mm -hmm. Well, they've been incurring all the costs at this point. Mm -hmm. So if every floor, when the floor is ready, they're not want to incur those costs anymore. Mm -hmm. So they'll give the, the purchaser to say, okay, you have occupancy. So what they'll do is I'll give you the keys. You get to move into the property, but you don't own it yet. Hmm. Because you can't, it can't be divided yet because the builder still owns the rest of the property. So mm -hmm. you have to do it all once. It can't be all or none. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay what they call an occupancy. And it's, so you pay something, what you pay what we call a phantom mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's like you're paying rent to live in your own unit, <laughs> right? And a it, phantom it cover, mortgage. It, it, we call it a phantom mortgage. <laughs> so phantom mortgage, what it is, it's, it's again, it's an occupancy. So if you have the keys before the, their property is registered in your name, you're paying a portion of utilities mm -hmm. and, and the taxes, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like a full mortgage payment. Once everything gets you and the rest of the building is built, then you get to start what we call registration. Mm -hmm. And that's when trans why that's when title gets transferred from the builder to all the individual unit holders mm -hmm. and that's when your mortgage actually kicks in mm -hmm. now depending on the builder <laughs> there's Wait, no set time it's it sounds when the like occupancy happens and registration happens and it could be years mm -hmm. i have a client I, I met this client at an open house she was eight months pregnant Eight months. She came Eight months. She turned around a little. Like, she was like, she's, like, she's pregnant, pregnant. Like she turned the corner of a hole. It was all belly. Yeah. <laughs> and she's awesome. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. Love her. Um, 
And she was her and her husband were talking. She's like, yeah, well, you know, pregnant with the first one, you know, like, I'm like, okay, like they wanted to move. They only have a 750 square foot condo. Okay. It's like two bedroom, but it's, it just, it, it would be, it's, it's kind of tight just the two of them, let alone the three of them. Okay. I'm like, we, they, and the builder at the time wasn't allowing them because they also set up when they allow to, to sell, to assign themselves. They're like, well, we can't assign it because mm. basically they blacklist it when they can. And, um, uh, we have to wait till we get them to go ahead till we've registered in order to yeah. sell. Okay. It took two years to, to register. They had two babies in the time their house was, their condo was registered and they weren't allowed to assign it. They were basically stuck in there. And what I think was happening was that the builder held back five units. <laughs> so what he was doing was he wanted to sell his units and he didn't want to have competition with the other unit holders. Mm. So he said, well, I'm not finished. So what happens registration, the rest of the, you have to have, you have to fulfill a certain criteria for them to be able to register. And he's saying, well, the, you know, the main areas aren't finished or something else. In reality, he was trying to sell five units above market value mm -hmm. until he sold those units. He wasn't registered in two mm -hmm. years. Then he finally registered. How happened to the family, the, the two, like they moved in? They're still, they're still. So now, well, it's long story short, we're going to hopefully get them into a property this year. Yeah. Because uh, they just really just registered and mm -hmm. they had the second baby. And it was just like, we started looking at properties. We're like, we need to calm down a little bit. We just need to, yeah. So we, and she just started another real business. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, so the mortgage wasn't working out. So anyway, long story short, we had to push it this year. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, from like hearing all these stories, <laughs> none of them sound positive. Well, okay. Well, but then there's properties like mine. Yeah. Like uh, my dad had purchased the property pre construction took seven years to build. He passed away in that time. I bought off my mom. She didn't want it. She paid three fifty for it. I can sell for six hundred thousand. I've been renting it for two thousand dollars a month. It more than covers my cost. I can put five hundred dollars in my pocket every single month. Mm -hmm. I bought one in Leslieville for the three twenty. It's not built yet. It, it's worth six hundred fifty seven hundred thousand dollars. I bought another one on in the Topico. We paid just under eight hundred dollars. So it's like almost a thousand nine hundred square feet with two part one parking. I could turn around for that for a million dollars now. Mm -hmm. We bought another one in. Uh, we just we just closed one in uh, in Kitchener. Paid three hundred thousand dollars for it. I could sell for six hundred. It just got built and registered. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are four wins right there. But I can I can push back on this, right? I can say you're fortunate to be in a position like where you have the luxury of waiting, right? Because, right. but for someone who is getting in the game real quick, they're like, okay, I am going to put this cash. There's no cash coming back to me. So you, your cash is just being held into something. Yeah. But someone like you, you're a seasoned investor. So to you, like, oh, okay, I can wait five years because I'm like, whatever. But that's but that was my play the whole time. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. Mm. So if my five year little less ten years, I don't give a shit. Yeah. I'm not moving into it. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I don't know so would you advise it for someone who is like buying a property for the first time no. to get it to pre con? Hell no. Never, eh? Never. Okay. No, oh, and that's why like 90, 95% of buyers of these condos are, are investors because mm. they know builders don't the fuck they're doing. Excuse my language. I'm sorry, not, they're not know what they're doing. It's, unless you're like those seasoned vets that are constantly hitting the targets, 90% of them aren't hitting targets. They're all being pushed back. Mm -hmm. Like even the good guys are getting pushed back that are like, like my mother bought a tried old unit. It's supposed to be ready in 2025. They've already pushed it back three months already. Like, and, and they're fantastic builders. And mm -hmm. it's just like, even they have delays. Mm -hmm. But my mother wanted the three years because she needs time after my dad passed away. She's got a big house. We need to, it's going to take her three years to clean that thing out. Yeah. But, but if you're a first time home buyer, you don't have a place over there too, do not buy it. Pre-con. Are you kidding me? Do not like, listen, I'll slap you. I was just like, just like, let's look at, there's so many other properties we get you into tomorrow, like mm -hmm. in a month or something else. Since you're like, just let's, you know, like you're, you, there's just a lot less risk. Mm. So in your opinion, who fits the profile of buying a pre-con? Who fits the profile? Yeah. Like describe the profile. If you're like, if you're this person, I'd advise you buying a pre-con. Okay. If you are a downsizer, if you are, what you're coming from a large home and what you have time and what you want to get into a condo and you can pick your finishes and something mm -hmm. else, you don't, you don't mind waiting an extra year or two is not going to bother you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. You're an investor. The longer it takes, the better. Mm -hmm. That fits the profile. Again, you're given that has the cash flow was able to do that. Absolutely. Uh, if you are, even if you're a first time home buyer and you are living with your parents and you're young and you don't mind living with your parents another five years. Cool. That's cool. But somebody who needs to live and do something within a year or two, because mm -hmm. otherwise you're spending money on rent. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. No. Be 
because like listen if you're if you're buying a pre-con and then you're like oh just rent for a year or two till it's ready yeah try three four or five years rent mm. gone mm. you know one thing i also want to get sorry i'm not shitting on pre-construction because I, I i what's that you're just keeping it real i'm just keeping it real like i, I don't shit on it because i made money on it Mm-hmm. So I can't say that I'm, I'm not shooting on it at all. I'm just saying I'm just being real. I'm just mm-hmm. being listed. I'm like, don't, and I and I stir people away. Like one of my clients right now, we had a pre-con, and I said, no. Like we looked at the pre-con the prices. We're like, you can buy that in Toronto, mm-hmm. as opposed to Milton, at less value, and you're gonna your clients. You start making money tomorrow. Mm. As we work towards wrapping up, right? Um, <laughs> financing the pre-con. Can you use a line of credit to buy pre-con? Let's say if you don't have the cash on hand, but you do have. Yeah. credit at like 60k can you use something like the builders take that yeah they don't care what the they don't from. care no, like, you can do a personal check yeah it doesn't have to be like when you're when you're purchasing a property uh your deposit has to be like in liquid form mm-hmm. well when you're buying pre-con you just give checks so so many times like they've taken money and like seventeen thousand dollars in my account I'm like what the hell why am i in overdrive? i'm like oh that's right I, I forget about it and then my bank's like oh you have to add money because i i try to keep a zero balance on my bank account mm-hmm. or close to zero balance because for me, for opportunity costs, like I rather I've I run my 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 bank accounts like I used to run the treasury. I tried to keep my actual cash down, and I just put on my lines of credit, and then I borrow, mm. move it around. I move from one account to another account. That's some game right there, you know. Like, it's fun. Well, you're just constantly in there. It's it's fun, you know. Yeah. It's like that's so. It's like like for example, I was before this podcast. I looked at them like because I have so I for the corporation, for example, I pay myself. I'm, I'm an employee, right? So I pay myself. So I try to match up when I, my my mortgage payments are coming on here too. And I saw them, like, they pulled out the mortgage payment just a day earlier before I got paid. I'm like shit. So I had to borrow yeah. money off the line of credit to pay off myself, which I have to put back in tomorrow. So it's one day of interest. So it sucks, but it's yeah. like yeah. But I just I I I, I messed up. By one day, <laughs> yeah, like that line is say like Robin Peter PayPal. <laughs> yeah, I do all the time. Yeah, but that's how you make money, though, right? Yeah, it's like man. knowing how to move the money around and everything. And yeah. lastly, how did you learn this flow of? Because it seems like you have your business, you have your properties, you have your investments. Did you just learn by trial and error? Or Pretty you, much, yeah. yeah. But the the financial aspect, obviously, with the Treasury analyst really helped because mm-hmm. that uh, and spreadsheets and those kinds of things, like the financial aspect. Yes, but. Uh, I've always with hockey was a really big thing for organization and like playing university. The structure we had there was uh, that I had to give to myself. Like I, I graduated with honors there too, and everyone's like, I used to, so I used to party like crazy. Like I, I had a good time. Played on the hockey team, graduated with honors, always on the dean's list. And it's just like, well, how did you do that? It's like it's all about scheduling. Mm-hmm. Never missed a class. You know, like I loved going to school. Uh, you like working. being a student. Yeah, I like working. I loved working out. I loved going to see it, but I just had everything, everything had to be scheduled. So I brought that aspect into my real estate too. And that's how I compartmentalize things. It's like, I had a buddy of mine who goes, how do you do this? Like, how did you know how to buy? It's like, we, two of them, when I went away a couple of years ago, were taking on my business. They're like, how do you do this mm. by yourself? And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's easy. You just got to know where to put the people and when to, to show the properties mm-hmm. and just kind of like, and just put them in little silos. That's an artistry. But I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't realize other people weren't doing it. That's just how my brain works. Man, you know, you should like do some like consulting on that because I think that that level of knowledge can be worth millions to some people. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> but sometimes it's harder to get it on paper. <laughs> just, I, like, maybe you take some time to yourself, like like break down like, hey, this is like unit one of this. Okay, property, whatever, whatever. Yeah. And then someone will pay for that knowledge because yeah. that's like 20 years, like let's say 25, 24, 25 years of knowledge yeah. that could be worth millions. Trust me, like based on what you know. Uh, maybe we'll talk after the podcast. We'll talk after the podcast. <laughs> but that's why they're tuning in to DC Talk, right? They yeah, want to yeah. get some games. Uh, but everyone, mm-hmm. thank you so much for tuning in. That is episode four of the DC Talks podcast. I am your co-host, Owen Osende, with the main man, David, David Cinelli. And uh, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Have a great week. And we'll uh, talk to you soon. Ciao. Peace out.